I've been, I've been building machine learning systems for the last three to four years. Um, I was part of the startup called AutoCloud. I was building an AI and machine learning program which got acquired like one and a half year ago. And after that, I was lead machine learning engineer at a, a Canadian uh, company for news aggregation. And right now, I'm working on my own startup. And here, I'm here to share with you with some of my uh, insights that I've learned over time while building machine learning systems. Um, and just to show you the, the level of sophistication those systems can get, and to show you that the, the, the train is only a smaller portion of, the, of, those, uh, of those systems. So what this talk is not about, it's, it's not about statistics, it's not about gradient, it's not about how to train machine learning models, uh, it's about none of that. It's not about all these uh, you know, great, great uh, uh, methods of you know, training all sorts of very useful neural networks of, over data. Uh, but instead, it's about uh, it's a steps and challenges for for building AI with you know all this great technology for that that ends up turning into your recommendation systems, your robots. Uh, so essentially, we're going to talk about how to get uh, the the algorithms, the train the training, and then understand what happens before the training and what happens after the training. So we're, this is not what we're going to talk about. This and this are, is the topic of today's, uh, uh, today's uh, seminar. And why, why do we not need to talk about this? Because right now is, uh, the summer school is happening in any way. And I, I'm pretty sure that's what, that's what only they're going to talk about. So there is a lot of people focused on this. So that's why I'm interested in these two, and there's a lot of people who are doing this. So, um, and there's not a lot of people who talk about pre-processing data, like understanding the data, and then in the end, turning your models into a useful you know, set of you know, systems that you, you can deliver your machine learning with. So yeah, with, without, without further ado, um, this, is the, this is the AI <laughs> diagram, right? You, you pre-process your data, you train your model, and then you deploy your model. That, that's like the simple one, right? This is, a, this is like a how everyone starts, right? Thinking about how uh, these systems work, right? Um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward, right? Uh, doesn't look too complicated. But actually, uh, <laughs> some of the system look like this. Um, just before moving forward, I just wanted to uh, have a quick <coughs> remark of the format of you know I'm going to present this uh, you know these two parts right so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of this is going to be like these types of boxes which I'm going to describe on a certain level of high level right um, and just show like what they're supposed to do and if if I if I would go another level deep that would end up being like about four hour or more you know conversation with you. So that's why I'm going to stick with that. But anyone who is interested on any part of these, you know, uh, boxes that I'm going to explore with you, uh, we're more than willing to, you know, go deeper, right? So uh, this is just to the goal of this is just to show that it's a lot more sophisticated than it looks like from from when you read the newspaper or from when you read the, you know, uh, like a, your your regular, you know, YouTube machine learning video of, you know, they, they show you how to train. So yeah, is that is that fine if, if that's kind of the rules for this game for today? Yeah. yeah. So this is like a general overview of what I'm going to show you today, and then let's let's get into it. Um, so why why does it get so complicated? Why why it's not just like those three boxes, and then why don't we have you know why isn't it, why isn't the life that simple? It's because uh, in the last I don't know five years or maybe more than se like seven years. The, the, the way we build software has dramatically changed. Like we don't do any more monoliths, we, we now collect data. Uh, so uh, the, the software, the way it used to be, you know, RDBMS hooking up to your, <laughs> to your uh, .NET server or you know, something like with Java faces and stuff like that. So we, we now build microservices which allows you to you know, add separation of concerns and stuff like that. It allows you to you know, build like, you know, modular systems that you can plug in and out. 
and we, we use you know things like Kubernetes, which which allows you to schedule you know uh, containers to run simultaneously you know in a cloud environment or on your uh, local systems. Uh, so this allow this the Kubernetes along with Docker and, and like cloud systems they allow you to you know build like a pretty much world scalable you know software uh, at this time in the in the you know at this day and age. Um, and obviously there are like a bunch of different types of applications and this is only the surface of it. I haven't even like depicted you the robots, all sorts of hardware based applications which get to work with the internet. So essentially anything that gets to work with the internet is going to interfere with any one of these, right? And by saying AWS, it doesn't necessarily mean only AWS. Uh, it includes uh, Google's cloud, it includes every other cloud. So this just had a like, nice smiley logo, so I have to put it in. Um, so yeah, and this is this is a kind of a, an overview of what we get to deal with when we build the like internet software nowadays. Um, so so let's understand the, the data engineering and pre-processing with with all with all that in mind. Uh, essentially, if we if we simplify kind of try to you know the. Uh, take the juices out of all of this. We kind of have our applications. Just to show you, this is a here, right. This is your applications, right? And then we have the, our other services, which could be any part, any microservice in your architecture, or anything else that is in your ser that you know has the ability to do like request, response, and stuff like that, right? So those are pretty much the two you know entities that get to generate data. And that data could be of any sorts, right? It could be user data, it could be images. Like a uh, couple of my friends on Intelnet, they get like, uh, for instance, you know, aerial images of you know fields that, that you know that they take, you know, that, that the um, airplanes take a picture of, you know, that they can you know then process. So any source of data, you know, we can we, we gotta understand this as that as such. So. And this is the general pipeline, and we are going to go kind of in deeper with this. In this, um, so essentially, you, uh, you know, a bit of, uh, I'll talk a bit of about uh, storage, about the data lakes, you know, retrieve data, like for training, um, like pre-processing feature vectors, and then data set, uh, and then we will see like, uh, so how how even this, you know, straightforward looking thing can become sophisticated. So, so. Let's start from the beginning, the data engineering and pre-processing, and what does it mean to have a uh, you know, storage data lake? Uh, how, how many of you have, uh, is familiar with, you know, with this term, data lake storage? So, so it's, it's a, it's a, essentially data lake is a mechanism, it's kind of a name for a sophisticated or like a distributed file system that allows you to read and write pretty fast and allows you to kind of infinitely scale some, some of your files that you get to store into, into that file system. And it usually on the cloud or somewhere in your like own data center if you're courageous enough to build one. Or uh, like if, if you're building such a system that needs to have like, your own, then yeah, great. So this is kind of how it's good to think about the storage and data lake. So why, why do we need this? We need this because we have like a, a lot of you know different types of data that come comes on our way when we build these systems. And granted that we are successful and many people use our systems, and um, and we need like a, we need a sustainable way of storing the data, such as you know storing the history and you know terabytes and petabytes of data, and and like storing those data into you know relational databases or some kind of you know. Uh, structured databases sometimes get to be not as efficient as just dumping them into uh, some type of storage and then figuring out what to do afterwards with them, right? So this is this is pretty much this captures that idea essentially. Um, so so okay, now that we have a data lake, so what do we do with this, right? Because our initial goal was to, to was to train a model and like see how we can use it. So then we build systems that get to retrieve the data. And what does it mean retrieve the data? Uh, the best, the best example of such a system is essentially, uh, it's, it's obviously the Apache Spark or like Dusk, from which is a Python-based, you know, data processing, you know, tool that allows you to uh, parallel, parallelly, you know, do offline, you know, uh, 
offline you know, processing of data, right? So, and depending on the, on the format you store, for instance, Parquet, which is a distributed zip file that allows you to store, you know, tabular data. Uh, so there are efficient ways of, you know, retrieving your data from the, from the storage. So, and then this, this chunk of the system gets to do that. And then we will be building over this. Uh, so the next system after this, uh, essentially the processing steps, right? So we re do retrieve the data, and but we got to process it. So uh, what does it mean processing the data? The data we store here is not in a, you know, you know, the best shape usually because you got to pr pretty much throw data at your, you know, file systems, and then, you know, afterwards. This is here, and essentially in these two blocks is where you get to, you know, put, bring them into a shape that you can really understand and start to, you know, reckon, reckon about it. Um, so, so, for, so after you retrieve the data from, from the lake uh, with these two blocks where you get to, you know, process it and bring it into a good shape, now you are starting to think about machine learning. Now you're, so what's, what is it that we feed to our machine learning algorithms? It is the feature vectors, right? And here is an example. So uh, if you have a user data, for instance, you have like, a, I don't know, terabytes of user data that you have had saved, uh, this process would look like you have s s some jobs that get to retrieve the data and then maybe save it back into here with a bit of a pre-processed manner. And then another another step that gets to take that, and then for instance, uh, clean it up and make it better, like tabular or like the format you prefer. For instance, you know, to, because I'm not there with with such data that you save here, it could be you know historical, you know historically, you know backwards incompatibilities and stuff like that. So you need you need certain pre-processing before you even think about your feature vectors. So and then what the feature vectors are? Feature vectors are like you know various different representation techniques. They they involve uh, machine learning. You know also for instance like word vectors is essentially you train them, right? You train and it's a representation of you know of your textual data or like you know you can have you know auto encoders and stuff like that. So or like even you know simple thing as manual encoding. For instance, if you have a if you have a data that um you know. There's like discrete, you know, has, you know, for instance, uh, uh, you know, it can have like only three to four values, you know, have a field in your user object that can have only a few values, then probably it's, it's not a bad idea to think about one whole encoding. So essentially this, this layer of your system is get to deal with, uh, you know, building those features. Yeah, but, but, uh, So what do we do with those features afterwards, right? So one way is to go and then just keep building the data set. If I go, if I, if I go back to uh, my initial diagram, right? Uh, so I showed you this, you know, pre-processing and then feature vectors, right? And then immediately after that, the data set. But actually, in, a, in certain circumstances when, uh, when you have a lot of people who need these feature vectors, you gotta save them somewhere so that people can access it when they need to. Um, here's another remark about all of this. Uh, so a lot of these systems, they are not necessary to build, right? Uh, it will be like a tough call to say, hey, we, we gotta build everything over here to be able to do machine learning or like properly do it. But um, uh, so my goal here is to, to show you to the extent to which like bigger companies go to, right? So for instance, like companies like Airbnb, companies like, uh, you know, Netflix or Facebook, they, they have such, 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 you know, databases that store the feature vectors, right? Which means, like, they have a, they have a, if you have a user object, right, that comes through into your system, that user object ends up being, you know, represented in a number of different ways and gets stored as, you know, as part of the, you know, in, as part of your feature vector bank. And I'll show you why you need this, like, a bit later. So. Any of this system is not super necessary to have, but you need to, uh, this is more like to show you the, the steps so that everyone who is building these types of system, they can, uh, they can uh, pick and choose which part they need based on their problem. So essentially this, this, two, this, uh, this whole pipeline 
kind of together and encompasses the data engineering side of you know machine learning, you know, building machine learning systems, right? Because you need to the the, the most important you know the, the the very important part of building machine learning is to have a data in a shape that you 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 be able to train your models or like even even think about you know uh, like which models to pick and uh, and stuff like that. So this is that part. Um, so any questions by far? If I if I talk too fast, please let me know. I, I can slow it down. Okay, one question. Sure. Uh, the uh, pipeline that we have it depends on the what types of models that we have. So we are going to dynamically change our pipeline depending on our models, or uh, which part we separate it on the feature vectors or on somewhere else. So yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so that's that's a very good question. So if you have like I don't know five different models that you get to train for your system, right? Then you figure out then. When you, when you, for instance, sit sit around with your, you know, colleagues, and then you decide, you know, what type of data these models need to in order to to get trained properly, then you very soon realize that hey, we gotta have like five different pipelines, and this is what I mean when I say like it gets sophisticated very early, right? So, for instance, one way to think about it, uh, and I've actually implemented such system myself, mm -hmm. is to have uh, some kind of, you know, data store. Right, where you can uh, have you know five different pipelines, but save those features because if your goal of the pipelines is to have those features, right, you can save those features uh, agnostic of your models, mm -hmm. right, and, and think of it that way. And then when you're building those models, you can pick for each of the model, you know, depending on the feature. And then that will all also give you the freedom of in the future when you have a model where you need to, you know concatenate some features and stuff like that, then you can you know, use this to uh, efficiently you know, do that. So, so you do not limit yourself by, by just that, those five algorithms. But that's a good enough incentive to already start thinking about building a you know, storage like this. So, okay, why do we need that? So why do we need that? As, as we already discussed, and the, that question led to kind of be going over this already, is you need this feature vector bank to be able to build the data set for your training. So what does it mean? This this is a place where it contains, you know, for instance, if for each your user it has it's going to have several different representations and features for each of your entities, it's going to have several different representations. For instance, in companies like Facebook, there are teams dedicated to just building this. So there are like people who got hired to to just uh, build features out of their uh, out of their you know data, right? So and then and then the, the scientists actually get to pick and you know choose those features to build their data set for which they're going to train. Of course they also pick the algorithms for it. So yeah, and then obviously after data set you get to you get to train your model, hopefully. Um, so this is the part again we're we're not talking about. So uh, yeah, but actually it's not really the full cycle because at the end of the day you gotta evaluate your model in a way and then you know, go back to, you know, training. So there is a bit of a loop here. So this is where you get to explore, experiment, and evaluate, you know, the stuff you're dealing with. This is pretty much where the data scientist lives, right? And they get to, they get to, you know, have, you know, their, you know, interfaces over, you know, Python notebooks and IPython notebooks or like a, with the Apache Spark, it would be, you know, Zeppelin or like Databricks and stuff like that, <coughs> right? So they can experiment, they don't need to, you know, be you know, they can do whatever they want because at this stage you have already like safe space and then the, your researchers, they don't need to know what led you, you know, to have, to have this, uh, this feature vector bank. So yeah, this is, the, this, is the, this is about that. And I'd say this is, uh, if, if you follow this practice, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty efficient uh, to separate like the, the pure researchers from more of the engineering type people. Because then uh, they get to you know they get to you know focus on what they what they're really good at instead of you know uh, instead of you know getting the, their head into you know stuff that uh, you know it will take longer than than, than like a, an engineer. So yeah, essentially this is the this is the kind of the data processing pipeline altogether, right? So it starts from you get your data here. By the way, I'm not even talking about these two arrows because it's another, the whole different discussion here, right? These two arrows, like how the data gets into your database. So, you know, there are things like Apache Kafka, a bunch of the streaming services. 
yeah, that's like a totally different, you know, maybe a, a to topic of, you know, lecture. So, yeah, but let's assume it happens. So you get your data and then you essentially, the data propagates down to a feature bank and, uh, and uh, it ended up, you ended up, end up training some models for it. So, yeah, uh, obviously, if one, you know, depending on the size of the, you know, the company or the product, you get to, you, you can very easily you know omit any of those steps and like how fast you need to get stuff done yeah but this is like to the extent to which it can go so yeah and then now we train the model and then after the model we have um, we not, we need to understand so how do we you know get to get to bring the model to the reality right so because training the model is only you know that part but then after after you have the model what do you do with it Right. So, who 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 in this room gets to gets to train models? Who gets to you know you know deliver them in some way, shape, or form? So, okay. So, I'm going I'm going to go through like some some kind of a great. So, I'm going to go through some kind of a pipeline, and then in the end, I will ask how how is it close to what, the way you you do that, and then we can you know maybe generate some discussion over it, you know, to, get, to make it more interactive. So yeah, so at this stage we already have the train model, right? Which is presumably some kind of file like Tinkle, whatever, right? Like ONNX or uh, anything that becomes a like checkpoint TensorFlow, right? Um, and then to, we save that model somewhere, right? Like for instance S3, right? Or whatever we feel comfortable. So that's the first step and most immediate step we do. Um, and then after that, we gotta re figure out like the environment we're going to run our model at, right? So there are several different environments, right? One, do, for instance, if you're going to run your model in the cloud, uh, you probably should consider like something like Docker, right? But then there, there are a bunch of other runtimes too, like NVIDIA is another runtime when you, you could be running, you know, like um, your model somewhere in some other hardware like Intel and ARM. You know, like Core ML from uh, Apple actually runs, you know, a lot of the stuff on their GPUs that I have inside the... So the runtimes are different. So we will probably kind of bring all the examples over Docker because I assume this is the most familiar one, right? But there are many, many different runtimes for running your models. Um, and then this step is actually about the artifacts. Like, what does it mean to deploy? It means to produce an artifact that you can then launch in your environment. So if your environment is in cloud, then Docker image is the artifact. So Docker image is going to contain your uh, model file and then maybe some kind of API on top of it that you know that will allow you to serve the model. Right? That's one way of thinking about deploying models. There are a bunch of other ways, but let's stick to that for not, to not complicate our, our world. So yeah, these are this is this is the place where you, you create the deployment artifacts. Uh, yeah, and then after that, you actually got to deploy it. So uh, what, the, what does it mean? It means like take your Docker, for instance, and deploy to Kubernetes or deploy to somewhere in AWS where you can access it, like where you can get to serve. You can deploy to any other, you know, container container management service, right? Uh, and then you can scale them depending on like if you if you think a lot of the a lot of the deep learning models like uh, convolutional networks, uh, there a lot of them could be thought as uh, you know black boxes, right? So input and output. So then those are like stateless stateless you know, systems, so kind of not too difficult to scale. There is a different level of scale. For instance, if you have a huge model, you've got to scale the model you know, in a way that you know, it's, this artifact becomes too big. But that's, uh, again, like another big discussion. Right? So essentially, the way you scale is to just distribute it in, into a cloud in many, you know, many different, uh, different you know, instances. Uh, and, and again, the Kubernetes would be one way to do it for sure. Yeah, so essentially this wraps up the kind of our, you know, the you know, serving system, right? This kind of is essentially build. After you deploy, you get the REST API, and then in this way you essentially end up having the system that serves your model, right? From having the model, because you, you got the data processed, and then you, you got your trained model, and then you process it, up, process it up until you have the REST API, which you can now serve. Right? So this is that part of the system. Um, so what do we do with the REST API? Yeah. Then I, so um, 
you remember when we trained our model on feature vectors, right? So the, the feature vectors come, uh, the feature vectors are a, a result of pre-processing, right? Uh, and, and there is also another, another aspect to this. When you, train, when you train those models, the output of the model is not always the output you want to you know, serve to your app, right? Or other systems, you know? Uh, so one, one example of that would be, uh, like if you have a classification, for instance, you just, you know, set of, it just produces a set of you know, probabilities, maybe you want to uh, change that into maybe like one answer or two answer points, like top three classification and stuff like that. So that's like a very you know, naive uh, example of post-processing. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say, anything that hits this REST as API that you've deployed with your Docker, like the raw data, that it needs to get pre-processed in exactly the same way that your data got pre-processed for building those feature vectors. Why? Because your machine learning model is, uh, is designed to take in those feature vectors rather than like the raw data. Because, yeah, we, we took the raw data and we pre-processed it and now we've got to do it again every time we are going to apply apply your, our model. So, uh, yeah, so this, this kind of all together con create, constitutes our ML, ML services, right? So this is kind of end up being, you know, the, what we call, you know, hey, now our apps can, can get to use, so, uh, these services. So essentially it hits it with the raw data, right? We, de we have deployed this service in some, you know, sh shape or form, maybe in the cloud. And then it gives us, you know, the output after post-processing, right? Any questions so far? And, and you guys, the guys who get to deploy those models, yeah. How how different your uh, your process to this? I know this is a very general one, yeah. But I'm just curious to hear from you. So one thing that it just brings to mind is the pre-processing part of this part, and the, for the training models, have to share a lot of. Uh, feature. So if the model changes, that preprocessing changes, this one has to change. Oh yeah. So, so they are very interconnected. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, there, I, those things I keep adding dimensions on how, how much systems you get built to be able to serve these models, right? So, and I'm going to actually touch that after, in a, in a minute. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's move forward. So kind of these this, uh, systems together, uh, you know, just brings together like the whole like second part of the machine learning services, you know, serving the model thing, right, after we have trained it. Um, so this is our system that we, you know, for instance, call deploy and serve model. Uh, but hey, uh, actually, we forgot, we forgot this one thing, right? Like, what if we train the second model? Like, what happens when so we trained, so here we, we trained one model and then we deployed it all over to here and then we have now machine learning services. But then, but then we, like after three weeks, we collected a lot more data, maybe better, better quality, and then we end up training a completely different model than that. So what do we do? We just, like, what's the, what's the you know, sequence of actions after that? Uh, yeah. The, there is a there is like a, another subsystem system is forming which is like kind of called model management and uh, so what do we do right we have a train model we save the model somewhere with some name hopefully that also includes a version of your model if you have like three models built consecutively you gotta probably name them appropriately so then you can you know tell when and how the model was built so you can also version it that's that's this part, right? Model versioning, right? The model needs to reflect and why and how they're built. And then we gotta somehow lock the models. And I'm, yeah, bear with me, I'm gonna kind of go a bit more extensive on like why we need to lock the models. And then, yeah, and then back to deployment artifacts. So, locking the model mean, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll show it after. Yeah, so now we have a, our new like 1.0. After like we built one system, we realized it doesn't work for not some use case. Now we have the, the second version of our you know, uh, model serving and management system now that also contains the management. But hey, uh, 
what happens that when we want to uh, when we want to understand whether like the, the model that we have built today and like two weeks later, which one performs better, right? And here is an example. Um, so if your goal is to do recommendation, right? Um, and then your, uh, so how do, you, how do you understand whether your recommendation is successful? There are a bunch of different metrics. There is like a, you know, if, if, you're, if you have some kind of an app, you probably, I assume, have like a monthly active users, right? So then that way you measure, um, you know, how many people are, you know, like the churn and, you know, like how many people are active per month. It's a very, you know, classical measuring, measuring metric. Um, but then how do you understand, like, the, the recommendation system that you have built kind of uh, correlates to your monthly active users? So essentially you can build like hierarchy of metrics which correlate to each other. So for instance, if you have a page where you need to serve a recommendation, right, that recommendation page can have a metric that reflects whether your recommendation is good or not. Like the very classical and the most obvious one is the click-through, right? But then based on the specifics of your recommendation, maybe what you care is like to get people into, you know, this rabbit hole, like, uh, I get sometimes on with YouTube, right? You click on the recommendation and then it goes one after another, right? And it happens. So maybe that's what you need to measure, like how deep they go once they get hooked with your recommendation. So there are a bunch of different metrics you can measure. The idea is that you essentially, uh, you build those metric systems that correlate with the highest level metric you want to, you know, associate with the success of your website or or, or the app, right? So we had this example with, uh, with the recommendation, but a lot of these things could apply with robots, for instance. Yeah, if your robot has a one or two tasks, uh, you can always collect the data in the robot or maybe with the internet and then, you know, build those metrics. Like for instance, I, I gave you an example of a, a robot that uh, in the beginning that was, you know, um, uh, taking out the weeds in the field, right? So it's a robot that walks through the field you know, it takes a picture of, you know, it's surrounding maybe a couple of cameras and then, you know, it identifies the weed and then takes out, right? So, like, one measure would be, like, the number, you know, like, or frequency and stuff like that. So, there is a bunch of different metrics you can have in, with every, you know, you know, such system that you get to, you know, deploy your machine learning. Because uh, the machine learning systems can have two, like, evaluation metrics as far as I'm concerned. One is your... Uh, um, is your rate of accuracy, the mathematical evaluation, right, where you, where you can tell, based on this data set, my model works well, right, because my model, you know, I have a test set, I have a validation set, I train my, you know, I train my model, and, and it performs well on my test set and my validation set, right. But um, that's, that's, the, that's the mathematical one. That's the one that researchers are concerned about. But if I'm, if I'm going to convince my boss that uh, my model is doing well, I, I got to also convince them on the second metric, which is like, how does it contribute to your monthly active users or any, any of those you know, metrics that you care about as a business rather than as a mathematician or a researcher. So therefore, we kind of get to care about Therefore, we kind of get to care about those uh, two, two metrics. Any, any questions thus far about that? Please let me know if I'm speaking too fast. Uh, the only question that I might uh, come is that these models may need different pre-processing. So we will need different pipelines within our uh, pipelines, right? For all, both of them. So what do you mean by modeling? What the, model, what the model is? Do you include purpose? Well, yeah. Um, I, I've actually emitted that part, but uh, this got to be assuming the like, description of the same exact pre-processing steps uh, of the ones that you get to, you know, build your feature vectors, right? So if you if you um, if you are dealing with text, you 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 know you apply the some word to vec model, and then got your word vectors, and you got you got to apply them here too. And this preprocessing could actually be another such system. There is a bit of recursivity here. If this preprocessing is a machine learning system, right? You gotta probably have like a machine learning system inside the machine learning system, right? 
So this is kind of the reason I didn't go into that one because it, uh, yeah. I'm kind of wary of the time, but maybe I'm, I'm going too fast, actually. Uh, so yeah, uh, I omitted uh, lots of details. Like uh, this is a kind of simplified version, but yeah. This is uh, another, another like uh, nasty part, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So why, 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 why I was so talking about all these metrics, right? So again, if we come back to our initial problem, is um, we have a model right now, and then we had a model two weeks ago, and then we gotta figure out which one does better with the recommendation, right? So uh, the classic one is uh, to A/B testing. We're like. It's easier said than done. You got to implement the whole system that deals with it. Right? You, you have a, you have one model, and then you you deploy one, and then you gotta distribute them. You know, it ends up. You know, we already seen this system before, right? So we could probably could reuse it in some way. So, but this this new like machine learning system that you get to build has to be able to take like have several of such models deployed at the same time and serve them over some kind of load balancing that you know can say, hey, if you hit me, like 30% of the time I'm going to serve you this, and then 70% of the time I'm going to serve you like another model. And then here is like, there's so much hairy parts to this. Uh, like this is one way of doing, doing this, but there's a bunch of other ways. This could be no load balancing, and then it could be like you, you just hook this like, you just uh, redirect these APIs to ops to certain part, and then redirect some others to, so there is there is no one way of doing it. There is no like a, one truth of how to build these systems. So, but my goal is to just show like you know how you know not friendly it gets actually when you get to do that. So yeah, so we we kind of did a kind of significant changes in our machine learning services. Uh, yeah, and then we have the 2.0, right? Uh, it's a significant change, right? Because we totally changed this part. And then, if you notice, we also took this deployed artifacts and then put it back into the model management. And I'll share, and I'll, uh, I'll share why. Why Why do we need to do that? Uh, any questions this far? Yeah, um, what, if, what, if, what if we realize that um, the, model, the model that we served, like two of them, like with A-B test, we just figure out the one that we, you know, this one we don't need, we just need this guy. Right, so you gotta have like some kind of rollback, some kind of feedback process where you know your A/B test lets know this is your model deployer, then you just have to deploy you know one of them only. So there gotta be some kind of communication between these systems that uh, uh, that you need only one of those models, right? Because your your A/B testing has concluded that uh, statistically this one like does better than this one, right? So. Yeah, but I don't think this is a very easy arrow to implement as well. <laughs> like uh, the the thing with these guys is um, I put everything into boxes, but each of boxes is probably another topic of its own. But my my uh, goal with this lecture was to kind of really show the soft, the complexity of these types of systems that they can get, um, and then you know opening up each one of these boxes is uh, you know, another can of worms essentially. That you, uh, yeah. So actually, we, we, we kind of have uh, extended our um, our initial system that actually is sophistication. So we have a bit more, a bit more of a kind of different system over here, right? Um, so as I as I mentioned you in the beginning, so the format of this would be uh, mesh, like going to an ex you know to a length of you know, showing all sorts of these uh, um, possibilities with, you know, building, you know, these blocks of systems that interact with each other in some way that then get to constitute your, you know, machine learning system along with data processing. Uh, and then only a bunch of different details so that we can have like a deeper conversation on how to implement any of these boxes, right? So uh, that's why, and also I speak maybe too fast. So yeah, so that's why this kind of constitutes the, the formal part of the talk, right? Um, and then I assume we would have like a, like we would have people who would be interested in building these things and then you know, we can have a, like a uh, discussion of which part do you think is worth talking about in terms of details. I guess one would be... For what, but I ask. 
And uh, yeah, the one, the one with the pre-processing, right? If you have uh, several different types of pre-processing steps. So actually the reason with that, it depends on how you serve your model. So I've only shown one way of serving the model, right? So that's the API version of serving the model. But if you, for instance, have a system that has like Kafka or like some kind of streaming service, where you need to have an like asynchronous because serving model is like uh, um, not asynchronous, not like event based, right? You just uh, request and response that way. But then maybe you need to have your model as like for instance, like a message comes into uh, you know uh, Kafka and then it gets to you know change by you know applying model over it and then it, another type of message goes back down down the system, right? So. That's another, that's another, so that's the reason I didn't really go into the pre-processing. So, for instance, if you're building a system with, for instance, Kafka, uh, one way would be you, uh, you build like uh, modules of pre-processing where the same modules you could apply both in the, in the system where you had, uh, you had your data pre-processing, right, like a library or something like that. Because it, you just you just focus on like one one event at a time, right? So your your like library or a system just deals with that one event, right? And then you 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 make it as part of the code for in row basis. So that's one way of doing it. But I mean, there are a bunch of problems with that too. For instance, uh, like managing that library would be a problem, like uh, managing all this versioning. So it's not really uniform versioning if you do that way. So yeah. And that's that's why we have this uh, the name of this talk challenges. <laughs> so in that case, uh, how we serialize uh, the model? I mean, uh, if we uh, by model we mean uh, all the code, all the uh, weights, or even referencing part, and also the libraries in there. Uh, how we gonna serialize all the things? Uh, like the Easiest answer may be that we serialize by <coughs> having Docker images, but is that, like, are there any uh, better ideas? Like one way you can do for sure, you can build like pipeline, right, of Docker images, right, and then just call that pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of serializing the model, um, so we have a definitely a way to serialize the model in a way that you have the weights, you have the architecture, Right, like ONNX does that. So ONNX is a is a standard built by uh, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon, and a couple of other big companies together. That um, it's a protobuf based um, serialization. So protobuf, you, who who is familiar with protobuf? Yeah, so protobuf is a format that you describe like uh, some kind of data. Uh, like graph, right? So the neural network is a type of a graph. So you could describe that graph and the weights in the protobuf, and then what it does, it just generates a, in any language you want, and they have a list of languages, like Python, C++, Golang, anything, right? Java, uh, and it generates a source code based on your description of your data that you can serialize with. So if you have a Python code that needs to serialize certain object format in a binary format, then you then you then you have like the protobuf files and then you compile them into Python source code, which have, has these serialized functions, and then you just get to give the data to it like it's a dictionary format and then or like object and then you just serialize it. So why why does this matter? ONNX is a format based of this, right? And it's a it's a description of a graph, and which has uh, this, which which includes uh, operations which are implemented in C++. So, if you know with neural networks, there's like a lot of multitude of operations, right? Like mathematical operations, you know, hyperbolic tangent, you know, sigmoid, and everything, right? There's a big list of functions. So, what ONNX does, it just uh, has a list of functions actually implemented by hand and then being invoked as part of protobuf, but underneath it's C++ implementation, right? So essentially the, the way they, and that's kind of works over in their runtime, right? Because they invoke it. So they give you the, you get to serve your model as a, as a binary, 
described by their file, and then you retrieve it and run it in your runtime. And runtime is a, it could be anything. Like NVIDIA, for instance, has a Tensor RT. Um, so Tensor RT is NVIDIA's runtime. It gets to it works probably best with TensorFlow, but it also compiles ONNX. So compile means it will take your ONNX file, take the graph out of it, and compile it into their intermediate representation format. Um, maybe I got into too much technique. Like in, into your intermediate represent. So it's like another representation of your graph internally inside the tensor RT. Um, and it just uh, compiles that format into the executable that you can run on CUDA, for instance. Um, yeah, so that's, that's like uh, one way you can get from, from your code of model like up until like uh, something that executes on CUDA. Same, same is for Intel. So Intel has a thing called ngraph, which kind of does the same thing, but for Intel. Uh, they claim they do for every hardware, but um, I haven't checked it myself. Um, yeah, but what was the original question? So, how we serialize the post-processing thing or the versions of the libraries? Yeah, so, the, yeah, the, so ONNX is a way to serialize the, the model. Uh, there is no uh, known way of serializing post and pre-processing. So you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta deal with it in some, in some way, right? Um, so one way you can probably have like a, other executables that have like, you know, black box type executables, right? that you can you know, include as part of your model. Like you can save them as C++ like binaries or something like that, or you know, some kind of a library and then have, yeah. So that's kind of the best. Now I have done something like that myself, and it's actually a problem I'm actually focused on. Yeah, see, because uh, when we build a model with Python and with PyTorch, uh, if we want to serialize our model, uh, if we use ONNX to serialize the model itself, uh, we have to somehow, some other way, serialize the preprocessing and postprocessing. Yeah. So, uh, by making easier the model, the serialization overall is it not going to be easier. Uh, we, it, I can't uh, like easily serialize uh, and run my Python code on mobiles mobile phones. So uh, it is very strange that ONX doesn't provide yeah, they don't, yeah. for that. But, but that idea actually could apply and uh, it's something I'm going to try maybe like in the future to uh, essentially build those, you know. So like a lot of these, uh, a lot of these pre-processing steps, if, if there is a way to, you know, have like some <coughs> operations predefined, Right, you could maybe do very similar to the ONNX the way they, they do uh, with the actual neural network operations, like pre-implement them and name them, and then you know have some format that will save it in a binary that you can call during your runtime. So that's one idea. Um, other other idea would be to ask you write code in a certain way, maybe, right? So if I ask you to write code in a certain way, maybe I can get the chunks of your code and then, you know, convert them into, you know, like other binaries. Yeah, but but like the thing is that if we use ONNX, ONNX is a static graph itself, and we just can simply use, say, PyTorch code to compile the code or to uh, ONNX code. Well, PyTorch does compile with a bit of uh, but with like a bit of uh, with the tracing and the uh, just-in-time comp compilation. So what, what PyTorch does? So if you if you if you give PyTorch your object, or uh, like your neural network module, right? Something that this sends module, right? Uh, <coughs> what it will do? It will take take that module and turn it into intermediate representation. This is the kind of Py PyTorch 1.0 feature, the just-in-time compilation. So that I think it's called torch.jit, right? So it will take and turn it into your intermediate representation, and then there is also a function that you can call um, that you can call that it will actually export an ONNX binary, which you can like very I've tried it, which you can very easily run on uh, on an ONNX runtime. So if if we can like serialize any arbitrary code uh, with PyTorch JIT compiler. 
Uh, why can't we like serialize any Python code? Okay. I don't think it does arbitrary because uh, it does with tracing. So it's like a regular problem in uh, like com compiler theory, I think, or something like that. Uh, which is um, so if you have a if you have a um, if you have a code that you need to like e find some kind of binary representation, the way they do is like. Uh, you give it an input, right, and it records all the operations mm -hmm. that it, you know, your input cost your, you know, whatever function you have to execute while you gave it your input. So it's the tracing. So essentially, the the thing with PyTorch is that if your model has some like uh, other passes, like <laughs> based on data, I don't know. I don't know if it's a common practice uh, to build such models, but what if? So if your model has like uh, other passes, like you know, based on you know some features of your data, then it, it will only detect the part of your model that your input actually triggered while you did that. So that's that's the fluke with PyTorch thing. But I think it's uh, some limitation. And it's a it's a very very interesting problem to solve actually, to uh, figure out how to. And and I think the reason with that is that your code is not static. Like if if you gave if you gave like a static uh, TensorFlow graph, then that would be a different type of problem than you give like the yeah. like a a class that is an object of a class that is inter uh, descended from nn dot module. So then there could could be any like if statements inside which could you know screw the things up. So that's kind of the reason. But maybe maybe. Um, Maybe there is a way to. Uh, it's a it's a problem. That, uh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, I hope. Uh, yeah, I hope that all these you know very deeper you know practical parts don't um, don't worry out too much. I because I promised it wouldn't be too technical. <laughs> yeah, but it got like pretty soon, pretty quickly. Um, yeah. So any any other questions? So one question is the communication between data science and the data engineer. I mean, in small companies, both of them are the same team or same oh, yeah. people. But but there are parts that I'm not sure like how should be like the feature banks that we talked about could be like for example a new model that records the different types of features like the work to work like the different representation that you are upon. So the request goes to the data engineering and they have to provide or because it becomes a really different scenario. Sometimes those feature engineering for the feature bank is a model itself, like for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for example. So then it becomes the data scientist's job to provide that. So it yeah. becomes really unclear like, the job yeah. descriptions. So it's, it's a good question. And I can give you an example of that. Uh, so I was talking to a friend of mine who, who works at Facebook. And um, so he told me, like I asked the exact same question, because they have uh, people who get to build those feature vector banks. And like he works, I think, on, uh, what's the name, the newsfeed, mm -hmm. right? Um, so he, like, I think that those people who build those feature vectors, they build so many of those. Like, yeah, I think the problem is the other way, like uh, the data scientists to figure out which one they can use, right? But I'm, if it's a small company, right, you, you could have that problem. And uh, like a lot of these, you know, boxes that I showed, they're not mandatory to build. It just, uh, depending on the size and uh, what they're trying to get, you know, done. So a lot of them could be squashed into one, right? And you could have just like one system, you know, everybody works with that until you get big and then get successful. And then you get to, you know, become like a, a bit bigger and, you know, more sophisticated. So yeah, if you have like uh, two guys who are both data scientists and data engineers, um, yeah, probably you gotta talk to each other. <laughs> uh, it's a different type of organization in that in the when it comes to that. So yeah, you got you gotta also have a good relationship with each other. So you know, they do what you ask. Okay, thank you.